It's called the Master and Form. The artist says this sculpture is a cage-like dungeon, but also offers these ballet dancers license to express themselves. Created by a former ballet dancer, portraying three performances a day over a 19-week period, this piece explores the hardships endured by the human body. I question, you know, my body and, uh, and how, when I was a young dancer, like what my body was and what it wasn't. And so this piece kind of is also about creating agency for dancers so they can self-identify, you know, so it's been critical within the system of, of ballet. The curators of this biennial say vulnerabilities of the body are a consistent theme here, as is insecurity amongst marginalised communities. The collection is viewed as a gauge of what is inspiring America's contemporary artists. As well as the current social climate, climate change is also in focus. Increasing that feels like one of the most pressing, pressing issues on the table now, um, so I think it makes sense that artists are kind of getting into that space and dealing with that. The Whitney was founded in the 1930s with a focus on promoting exciting American talent. Emerging artists feature heavily again in this biennial. Of the 75 artists featured, three quarters of them are under the age of 40, many of them still repaying art college loans. There is a lot of pressure being placed on younger artists, um, from MFA debt to gentrification, um, pricing people out of studios, kind of changing the nature of neighborhoods and places where artists might be able to find studio space. This show has been in the works for two years and is seen as a laboratory for artists and a chance to discover new talent. This year, many of the works share the same exhibit space. It's an attempt to create a dialogue and demonstrate that different artists share some common inspirations. We want to create a platform for them to share their ideas, to take risks, to meet the public. Um, and I felt that the curators did an incredible job of kind of canvassing the waterfront and taking a snapshot of what they saw that was exciting to them. The hope is that excitement can also stir debate amongst viewers. The divisive decision by some predominantly black American football players to kneel during the national anthem is the focus of Kota Izawa's watercolour animation. The museum isn't afraid to tackle controversial topics and this biennial is no different. This piece by Pat Phillips touches on topics such as incarceration and the wall on the US-Mexico border. Inequality and injustice are common threads that weave through the biennial's two exhibition floors. And the past is used as a tool by many of these contemporary artists. Alexandra Bell chose to focus on how the 1989 Central Park Five rape case was reported and the role race played. Alana Harris Babu's three videos take a look at the American dream and consumerist culture. Her work shows a hypothetical design store selling reparations for past injustices to African Americans. She says the chance to display her work at the Whitney was a major source of motivation. Having an opportunity like this gives a young artist um, a, a reason to really like throw everything into it and make a work that they wouldn't have made otherwise because they know that someone's going to be looking back at it. This piece by Augustine Woodgate will keep evolving over the exhibition's duration. The sandpaper on the minute hand will wear away the faces of these slave clocks. Not every piece here is as dynamic, but all the artists featured hope their work will strike a chord and stand the test of time. William Denslow, TRT World, New York. Art critic Margaret Carrigan joins me now to tell us more about what stands out in this edition of Whitney Biennial, as well as the ongoing controversy surrounding Whitney board chairman Warren Kenders. Great to have you with us today, Margaret. So the presence of uh, Warren Kenders, the board chairman, created some controversy and some protests, including um, Michael Rakowitz, an artist that is participating in the biennial. How did that come about? Yes. So in the lead up to the biennial, when they first announced the participant list back in um, February or March, I can't remember now, um, Michael Rakowitz was meant to be included and he made a public statement that he would not be um, going forward with his project for the biennial. And that was linked to actually some protests that had broken out that started with Whitney staff members who were protesting the uh, vice chairman of their board, Warren Condors, based on his um, link to Safariland, which is a company that manufactures 
tear gas canis canisters that were used against asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. And Whitney Biennial is normally a very politically engaged art event. Um, how do you think the 2019 edition is reflecting the Trump era? I think that the 2019 edition is actually a little less Trump-centric than the last one, just because the 2000, 2017 biennial obviously was right after his election. So there was a lot of Trump-focused work in that one. This one is a little more subtle when it comes to that. There are a few works that address kind of the political situation. One such is by um, a Puerto Rican artist named uh, Daniel Lynn Ramos, which was who he was kind of unknown before this to a lot of people. Um, he actually has a work that addresses the Hurricane Maria crisis crisis that, uh, in Puerto that affected Puerto Rico back in 2017, when more than 3,000 people were killed. He made these assemblage sculptures of the detritus that washed up uh, around his home in Puerto Rico. That was a big political snafu on the, on, you know, the um, side of the Trump administration. So there are a few works like that that kind of obtusely point to some of the tension points within the Trump administration, but I wouldn't say that this edition is too Trump-focused. And Margaret, what do you think is the um, importance of Whitney Biennial for American art today? I think what the biennial really does uh, for a lot of emerging to mid-career artists is kind of really thrust them into the spotlight um, and, and kind of um, jumpstart their careers. It, it really can't be understated the, the effect that this will have for, you know, interest and demand in some of these, like, younger artists' work. So that was a big point surrounding the, the protests and also Michael Rakowitz's decision not to participate. There seemed to be a kind of implicit critique of the artists that were going to end up participating, and there was, there was concern that maybe they were being asked to sacrifice their politics in order, in, in order to participate, you know, on behalf of their work and get their work seen. And in a departure from uh, the previous editions where guest curators were brought in, this year's curators uh, are actually on staff. How do you think this influenced the results? Whitney saw an opportunity to kind of like control the, um, they, they installed two of their own to kind of make sure that they had people who were experienced with controversy and the way that could explode in, in a situation like the Whitney Biennial um, that, you know, we're going to be able to field that well. Now, on the other side of that coin, I think that what has happened is that there is, you know, some people think that the, the biennial is too, too soft or something or not politically engaged enough um, or, or the work within it isn't this year because maybe, you know, the, the curators are part of the Whitney and they felt maybe they had to, like, you know, couch, couch the content of the biennial a little bit more because they do have an allegiance and are on staff with the museum. Margaret Carrigan, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today.